In Pennsylvania, a missing persons case quickly turns into a homicide investigation. Only a piece of rope can link a suspect to the murder. Detectives in Washington state discover a family brutally murdered. To expose the killer, forensic examiners look to the victim's own blood. A 13-year-old boy in Phoenix, Arizona, vanishes without a trace. With no body and little physical evidence, investigators struggle to make their case. When juveniles commit murder, homicide detectives enter a realm of twisted logic. They turn to forensic examiners to follow the evidence, not the excuses, when promising lives become wasted youth. In this episode, some of the names have been changed. Cambria County lies in the rural northeastern highlands of Pennsylvania. It's a small, tight-knit community that experiences few violent crimes. But on November 6, 1997, Ronald Klotz discovered that his son was missing. He told police that his 15-year-old son, Micah Pollock, never returned home from school that day. No friends, he said he and his son were very close, and it was unlike Micah to take off and not check in. Mr. Klotz explained that Micah had come to live with him the previous spring. He had moved to Pennsylvania from Ohio, where he had been living with his mother. Micah seemed happy in his new home and was enjoying making new friends. Ronald Klotz's ex-wife said she hadn't heard from Micah in some time. Though teenage boys often run away from home, Detective Greg Batcher of the Pennsylvania State Police soon learned it was unlikely that this was the case with Micah. As we began to talk to his friends, uh, they said that he wouldn't do that. They said that he was not the kind of person who would just up and leave. He had no reason to up and leave, and that uh, that's when the suspicion began. Investigators learned that the missing teenager had recently begun dating a girl from school. When questioned, the girl told police that on the day Micah disappeared, he told her he was going hunting with 16-year-old Andrew Callahan. That surprised her. Andrew Callahan was her ex-boyfriend, and he seemed to resent Micah. She explained that when she and Andrew broke up, she began seeing Micah. But Andrew was possessive and had even threatened Micah on a few occasions. Andrew couldn't seem to let go. He was very jealous, uh, very uh, demanding of her, and it just, uh, uh, according to her, that he was just you know, watching her all the time. He did not want uh, her to be with someone else. She wasn't sure if Micah had actually gone on the hunting trip with Andrew that day. Several days passed with no word from the teenager. Police, friends, and neighbors organized a search of the area surrounding Micah's home but their efforts turned up no clues to the missing boy's whereabouts. Desperate for a lead, police set up a roadblock nearby and questioned passing motorists. Though it seemed like a long shot, the effort paid off. A man recognized a photograph of Micah. He was in the area a few days before, and while pulled over in his vehicle, he had seen Micah with another teenager. They were heading toward an abandoned strip mine. The boy with Micah carried a shotgun over his shoulder. 
he thought the other teenager could have been Andrew Callahan. The next day, police and forensic technicians followed up on the lead. They traveled to the strip mines where the motorist had seen the two teenagers a few days earlier. Recent heavy rains made searching the area for clues a challenge. But soon after the search began, investigators found something that seemed out of place. It was a trash can in relatively good condition. Technicians found several red droplets on the can. They tested positive for blood. Investigators preserved the murky rainwater from inside the can for further testing. A search of the surrounding area failed to yield any additional clues. All of the evidence was forwarded to forensic examiners. At the Pennsylvania State Police Crime Lab, criminalist Bruce Tackett first needed to determine if the blood stains on the trash can had originated from an animal or a human. Using a chemical that reacts to proteins in human blood by turning pink, Tackett concluded the blood was human. But to generate a genetic profile from the evidence, Tackett would need additional samples. The remaining stains were too degraded for a more comprehensive analysis. Though there was a chance that blood was present within the liquid contents of the trash can, he realized that the rainwater had likely diluted it. The only way to extract remaining blood proteins would be to first remove the water from the sample. Tackett poured the liquid into a pan and then placed it in an evaporation chamber. In this dry environment, with an air current passing over the sample, the liquid was slowly removed and the solids became more concentrated. After most of the water had evaporated, Tackett tested the sample to see if there was any blood protein in the residue. He couldn't detect any, but he did find a potentially valuable piece of trace evidence. A single strand of human hair Though there was no way to confirm whose hair it was, police feared it had originated from Micah Pollock. Investigators returned to the area around the strip mines where they found the trash can. This time, they brought a cadaver dog. the dog signaled to a nearby beaver pond. There, in a shallow area of the pond, searchers found the decomposed body of a young man. The victim had been shot in the back. His ankles were bound with rope and his clothes severely tattered. Through dental records, the medical examiner confirmed that the week-long search for Micah Pollock had finally come to a tragic end. Micah had been killed by a 12-gauge shotgun fired at close range. And based on the bruises and abrasions to the body, the examiner concluded that the teenager had been killed elsewhere, then dragged to the place where his body was found. Now, investigators turned their focus to finding the boy's killer. 16-year-old Andrew Callahan, the last person seen with Micah Pollock, was their prime suspect. 
With his father present, the teenager refused to answer any questions without an attorney. Andrew, I have no choice but to arrest you. Though the case against him was largely circumstantial, investigators placed Callahan under arrest for right suspicion of murder. Silent. Anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. Detectives secured warrants to search the Callahan family's home and vehicles. Almost immediately, they found a clue. And as we were going up the driveway, you could see something hanging from the back of the vehicle near the bumper. As we got closer, it was obvious that it was a piece of rope hanging from the vehicle. It appeared to be the same type of rope found tied around Micah's ankles. As the team made their way to the residence, they discovered more rope on the porch. From inside the house, they retrieved four shotguns and a bag of hunting clothes that belonged to Andrew. All of the items were sent to the crime lab for testing. Ballistics testing on shotgun pellets is nearly impossible. Sergeant Badger, may I help you? And in this case, examiners were unable to demonstrate that the shotguns retrieved from the Callahan's home had been used to murder Micah Pollock. But if technicians could identify even a tiny droplet of Micah's blood on Andrew's hunting clothes, police would be one step closer to tying the suspect to the crime. But none of the clothing samples tested positive for blood. Some of the results were in the lab. Though convinced of Andrew Callahan's guilt, police couldn't seem to find a shred of physical evidence linking him to the crime. With the suspect unwilling to cooperate, investigators were running out of ways to prove that Callahan was a killer. Police in Cambria County, Pennsylvania, struggled to solve the murder of 15-year-old Micah Pollock, whose bullet-ridden and tattered body was discovered in a remote pond. Though all of the circumstantial evidence pointed to 16-year-old Andrew Callahan as the killer, Pennsylvania State Police had little physical evidence to prove it. Their last hope for making their case fell to forensic scientists at the Pennsylvania State Police Crime Lab. Examiner Bruce Tackett looked for consistencies between the rope found tied around the victim's ankles and the samples collected from the suspect's residence. When I did the rope comparison in this case, I determined that the ropes were a clothesline type rope. They had a woven or a braided cover over top of a core of uh, fairly coarse uh, man-made fibers. I examined all three of those pieces of rope that I had, determined that the construction on all of those was exactly the same. For proof that all of the samples had originated from the same source, Tackett needed to examine the construction of the rope's core. Under a high-powered microscope, he found that the fibers that made up the core were all indistinguishable from one another. I was able to determine that those ropes were identical in construction and that the fibers used in the construction of those ropes were the same. So essentially, those three pieces of rope were identical. The rope used to bind Micah Pollock's feet had come from the same source as the rope tied to Andrew Callahan's car. We have all this evidence against you. When confronted with the evidence, Andrew Callahan decided to talk. He admitted that he had shot Micah while the two were hunting. He claimed that when the shooting occurred, he was tracking a bird as it flew into some nearby brush. He believed his gun was positioned at a downward angle. He didn't notice that Micah, who had been standing some distance away, was in his line of fire. Afraid that police wouldn't believe his story, he said he panicked and tried to get rid of the body. 
closest we have found the road. Looking to corroborate the suspect's story, police turned to the evidence for answers. From powder burns observed on Micah's body, the medical examiner concluded that the gun was no more than three feet away when it discharged. And the shotgun pellets that entered the victim's back came to rest near his jaw. The weapon had been held at an upward angle, contradicting Callahan's claim that he had been aiming at the ground when Micah was shot. Police believe that Callahan went hunting that day with only one target in mind. I got another one over there up on the hill there last year, and there's this, uh, the teenager who way. was now dating his ex girlfriend. Pennsylvania State Police Detective Greg Batcher believed that after the shooting, Andrew systematically went about covering up his actions. He purchased the garbage can at the store and then returned to the scene. At some point in time, he also gathered a piece of clothesline from his residence. He took these items to the scene, back to where the body was lying. But when Micah Pollock's body wouldn't fit in the garbage can, he used rope to drag the body some 400 feet behind his car until he reached a remote spot. 16-year-old Andrew Callahan was tried as an adult. He was found guilty of first-degree murder and sentenced to life without parole. Police believe that irrational jealousy drove Andrew Callahan to murder his rival. But sometimes, investigators can find no motive at all. A suburb of Seattle, the Woodbridge section of Bellevue, Washington, is a quiet neighborhood. One that is unfamiliar with brutal crime. On January 5th, 1997, a morning 911 call brought Bellevue police to a secluded park. A passerby had discovered the lifeless body of a young woman. A rope fastened tightly around the victim's neck made it clear she had been murdered. Police began searching for any form of identification to tell them who this victim was. No other visible sign of Lying near the body, they found a checkbook the account was in the name of Karen White, and it listed a San Diego address. Bellevue police searched through records looking for a Karen White who matched the victim's description. Homicide detective Jeff Gomes found a potential match. A 20-year-old woman with that name and physical description listed a previous address just a few blocks from the park where the body was found. After confirming it was the same Karen White that had been found murdered, Detective Gomes had the grim task of making the notification. As a detective, one of the most difficult tasks you have is notifying next of kin of a death in their family. Uh, I don't enjoy it. It's very difficult to do. Several hours after the body was recovered, detectives went to the White home. Though several cars were parked in the driveway, the house was dark. No one appeared to be home. Detectives discovered an unlocked door. Fearing that someone could be in danger, one of the officers entered the property. The house was eerily silent. It appeared the residence had been robbed. After finding no one downstairs, the detective proceeded to the upper floors.
As he approached a bedroom, he noticed bloodstains on the outside of the door. When he looked inside, he discovered the lifeless body of a teenage girl. She had been viciously beaten and stabbed to death. He yelled for his partner to call in for backup. Next, he followed a trail of blood that led down the hall into another room. There, he found another grisly scene. A middle-aged couple lay dead. Their skulls had been crushed, and they had been stabbed repeatedly. The victims were later identified as 17-year-old Janet White and her parents, Regina and Walter White. They were the immediate family of the young woman found murdered in the park just hours earlier. Forensic technicians began searching for clues to help them reconstruct what happened. All of the victims had been savagely beaten with a blunt object and then stabbed dozens of times in the face and neck. Police photographed and swabbed dozens of bloodstains. The only real clues to the killer's identity were bloody boot prints found on the carpet. And one on the back of Walter White's shirt. Though the triple murder at the White residence appeared to be the result of a robbery gone bad, that didn't explain the murder of Karen White just a few blocks away. Well, the, just the area around the, the water tower, the, the picnic area and stuff, there looked like there's some activity of people being up there, but we don't know if it's related to the crime or not. There's not a whole bunch of stuff. In a community that witnessed few homicides, police were convinced that finding an entire family murdered in one day was more than a coincidence. The main question was, are these scenes connected? Was that the same? suspect acting in both scenes. Uh, was it a one-time in incident where a person killed this family, and, or was it a serial killer? Despite the lingering questions, police were faced with the reality that at least one brutal killer was on the loose in the city of Bellevue. And until they could identify a suspect or an apparent motive, police were powerless to stop him from killing again. While searching for answers in the strangulation murder of 20-year-old Karen White, Bellevue, Washington police made a shocking discovery. A few blocks away from where her body was found, detectives discovered that her parents, Regina and Walter White, and her 17-year-old sister, Janet, had been brutally beaten and stabbed to death in their home. Police focused their investigation on Karen's murder, believing that her killer was responsible for the other three homicides. Through interviews, investigators learned that before Karen moved to San Diego to become a volunteer in the AmeriCorps program, she associated with a tightly knit group of teenagers who were part of a movement referred to as goth. It's young teenagers uh, dressing all in black, painting their faces white, uh, dyeing their hair. They sometimes pretend to be vampires with fang teeth, uh, and, and they dress the part uh, witches. They pretend to be witches. Police learned that one of those friends had seen Karen the night before her body was discovered. The friend had stopped by the White residence. Karen had come back to Bellevue for a few days to visit her family. That night, Karen wanted to run out and do some last minute errands before returning to San Diego the following day. After being dropped off at home a few hours later, Karen said she still had one more errand to run. She wanted to see a teenager named David Anderson who owed her some money. 
the friend decided not to go along. Police jumped on the lead. Under questioning, David Anderson, a 17-year-old high school student, confirmed he and Karen White were friends. But he said he hadn't seen her since she had come back into town. On the night of the murder, he stated he was at a friend's house all night. He and his friend never left. When asked if he owned any boots, Anderson said he had one pair and retrieved them for the detective. But it was clear that the sole pattern on his boots did not resemble the bloody prints recovered from the victim's residence. Frustrated, investigators continued interviewing Karen White's friends. One believed she had important information. She said that on the night of the murders, David Anderson had been at her apartment hanging out with her roommate. Around 10 p.m., Anderson and her roommate, 17-year-old Alex Barani, decided to go out. She recalled that Alex had something stuffed inside the sleeve of his overcoat. She thought it was a bat or a club. The woman fell asleep a short while later and was unsure what time the two returned to the apartment. Having caught David Anderson in a lie, police turned to his friend, Alex Barani, for additional information. Alex was cooperative and even friendly with police. He insisted he and David had been home all night. But when detectives confronted him with his roommate's statements, his demeanor changed. Homicide detective Bob Thompson. His chin began to quiver. He immediately started sweating. And he became visibly nervous. I, at that time, decided, I think this guy did the murder. Under persistent questioning, Alex Barani unraveled. The 17-year-old confessed to all four murders. He said after leaving the apartment, he dropped David Anderson off at his girlfriend's house and then went to the park alone to meet Karen White. He planned to tell Karen that David would be unable to pay back the money he owed her. On his way there, he decided he wanted to know what it was like to kill. He strangled the young woman. Fearing that Karen had told her parents her plans, Alex went to her home and bludgeoned and stabbed the family to death. Alex Barani said he had thrown away his boots that had left the prints found at the crime scene. He was placed under arrest and charged with the four murders. Though Alex had confessed to the murders, Investigators knew from experience that they still needed to scientifically corroborate his statements. And they were unconvinced that he had acted alone. All of the crime scene photographs from the White's residence were sent to renowned blood spatter expert Ross Gardner in Georgia. Gardner looked to reconstruct the triple murder one droplet of blood at a time. Most of your forensic evidence tells you who was involved in a crime. But what happened at the crime and how it happened is sometimes very significant. And bloodstain patterns speak to those events that created the bloodstains. They tell us what happened and how it happened. Using bloodstain patterns observed in the photographs, Gardner first looked to establish what types of weapons had been used in the murders he recognized two distinct cast-off patterns. 
The first type of pattern was consistent with having been caused by sharp force trauma, most likely by the blade of a knife. The size of the stains are very small, and here in particular, very similar to what we saw on the scene. And the reason being is we have a very thin edge on which the blood can accumulate as it's being cast off. A larger blunt instrument made the second type of blood stain pattern that Gardner identified. If we were to observe a cast off that is the result of a club or uh, a bloody hand being swung, something like that, we're gonna see a significantly different kind of cast off. We're gonna see larger stains, greater volume, and they're gonna develop over a little bit wider area. Next, Gardner set out to understand the sequence of events inside the master bedroom. His first clue came from the tiny blood stains found on the back of Walter White's T-shirt. Those stains had originated from his wife, Regina. That suggested that she had been the first victim, attacked in the couple's bed while her husband lay sleeping beside her. The father had his back to his wife as she was being attacked in the very early stages of the blunt force attack because it was very tiny spatter that impacted on the back of his t-shirt. To understand what happened next, Gardner entered the coordinates of all of the blood stains found in the room into a computer database. Then, specially designed forensic software was applied to the data. The location and pattern of the father's blood found next to the bed suggested he was attacked with a knife as he tried to get up. A trail of his blood led from that spot to the foot of the bed where his body finally came to rest. There, more of the father's blood was found spattered on the walls, indicating he came under attack a second time. Those cast-off patterns had been caused by both a knife and a blunt object. When we took the combination of all the stains that were found in this corner, it really demanded, there was really no other explanation but that this spatter event was occurring and the sharp force was occurring from the other side. The stains indicated that the attacker stood in front of the victim's head when beating him with a blunt object, which caused his blood to eject into the scene in a radiating pattern. But Gardner found no blood spatter on the surface of one section of wall. The only explanation for the finding was that there was a second attacker standing in front of that wall. Lastly, the blood evidence showed that 17-year-old Janet rushed to her parents' room, but then was attacked and then dragged back to her room where she became the final victim. Gardner's analysis was consistent with Alex Barani's confession, with one major exception. He had not acted alone. Bob Ross. And investigators believed that Alex was protecting his friend, David Anderson. Police obtained a warrant to search the vehicle David Anderson had driven on the night of the murders. They found a length of rope on the front seat. Forensic examiners concluded that it was the same type of rope used to strangle 20-year-old Karen White. David Anderson was also charged with four counts of murder. Police believe that David Anderson and Alex Barani murdered Karen White at the park, motivated by sick curiosity. They next set their sights on the victim's entire family. Based on their complete disregard for human life, Alex Barani and David Anderson were tried as adults. Both received four consecutive life sentences. In Washington state, 
analysis of the crime scene helped expose a second killer's identity. But when police are unable to locate a victim's body, proving murder is much more difficult. In the late afternoon hours of November 10, 1995, Rhonda Mitchie entered the Phoenix Police Department to report her child missing. She hadn't heard from her 13-year-old son, Brad Hansen, in nearly 12 hours. Though Brad was a responsible and loving son, he seemed to be going through a rebellious phase. In fact, Brad had been recently grounded, and he was supposed to come straight home after school. After saying goodbye to him earlier that morning, Rhonda, a single mom, went to work. She later learned that there were no classes that day. She called Brad's pager and contacted several of his friends. But the 13-year-old never called back, and his friends hadn't seen him that day. Detective Sally Dillion agreed to look into the case. She was optimistic that there would be a quick resolution. We thought he'd ran away from home, that he was staying with a friend, and, you know, that in a day or two, three, that he would return home. But after several days went by without a word, authorities several hundred miles away in California were dispatched to the home of Brad Hansen's father. Investigators hoped they would find the boy there. But Mr. Hansen had not heard from Brad in some time. And he was troubled that his son had not checked in. Phoenix police distributed photographs and a description of the missing boy throughout the area. But no clues to his whereabouts surfaced. A search of the desert and mountain areas outside of Phoenix also turned up nothing. Brad Hansen seemed to have vanished without a trace. Police in Phoenix, Arizona continued searching for 13-year-old Brad Hansen, who had been reported missing by his mother. Having uncovered no clues to the boy's whereabouts, detectives began questioning his classmates. Brad's girlfriend, Jennifer, said that on the day he disappeared, she went over to a friend's house to hang out. Brad was also supposed to be there. But when Jennifer arrived at her friend Jeremy Bach's house, she learned Brad was no longer there. He had left his favorite ski cap behind. Then, in the kitchen, she noticed a hole in the wall. There was also a reddish-brown stain on the floor. 13-year-old Jeremy told her that he and Brad had been playing cops and robbers with his stepfather's guns. Not knowing that the guns were loaded, Jeremy said that Brad pulled the trigger, firing around into the wall. The stain on the floor, he said, was ketchup. Jeremy told Jennifer that after the gun went off, Brad rushed out of the house, afraid that he would get into trouble. He didn't know where Brad went, and he hadn't heard from him since. Jennifer hadn't heard from him either. Investigators arranged to interview Jeremy Bach and his stepfather. Jeremy told the same story he had relayed to his friend, Jennifer. But when pressed on specific details, Detective Sally Dillion sensed that he wasn't telling the entire truth. There were parts of it that we had a, a, a notion were probably going to be true, and other parts that you could tell weren't. Um, times when he would make the eye contact and other times when he wouldn't. As investigators struggled to figure out what Jeremy was hiding, 
word came in that another classmate wanted to speak with police. In the principal's office at the nearby junior high school, police questioned one of the missing boy's friends. He believed that Jeremy Bach had done something to Brad Hansen. It was well known around school that Brad and Jennifer were boyfriend and girlfriend. And it was also known that Jeremy was extremely jealous. He also liked Jennifer. And though he and Brad were friends, Jeremy tried to break up the young couple's relationship. According to the classmate, Jeremy had been bragging that he was going to hurt Brad. Investigators feared Jeremy Bach had made good on his threat. But to prove that a crime had been committed, they needed to locate the victim's body. Kevin's gonna meet us down there. To do that, they struggled to put themselves inside the mind of a 13-year-old killer, one who didn't have access to a car. We really had nothing, so we tried to figure out what we could do, and the only thing that we came up with is we just put them in the trash. Detectives formulated a plan. Once a dumpster is put out on the curb, it is considered public property in the eyes of the law. Two weeks after Brad Hansen was reported missing, police returned to the Bach residence. After the trash was put on the curb, investigators confiscated the can and then replaced it with another one. Once the trash can was secured in an evidence property room, Detective Dillian contacted forensic examiners at the Phoenix Police Department's crime lab. As soon as the lid was opened, investigators knew their instincts had been dead on. Large stains and dried liquid pooled in the bottom tested positive for human blood. And forensic scientist Kevin Knapp didn't believe anyone could have survived such blood loss without immediate medical attention. The dumpster is probably about two feet in diameter and there was probably about an inch deep pool of blood, dried blood, in the bottom of the dumpster. Uh, so even without being a medical examiner, in my opinion, it was an awful lot of blood, more than I typically see in a case. Now, examiners needed to verify that the blood found inside the trash can had originated from 13-year-old Brad Hansen. But there were no DNA samples from Brad to use for comparisons. Knapp had another option to get the evidence he needed. We all get our DNA from our parents. We get half from our mother and half from our father. So you can look at a DNA profile from an offspring and determine whether or not the DNA pattern from the parents could have uh, formed that child. When the DNA samples collected from the trash can were compared to the genetic profiles of Brad's parents, examiners found a match. Detectives confronted the 13-year-old suspect with their findings. Now, Jeremy Bach claimed that while playing cops and robbers, his hand accidentally hit the countertop and the gun he was holding discharged. Sending Brad Hansen flying backwards into the wall. He didn't realize that his finger was on the trigger Panicked, he cleaned up the blood and disposed of the body. For investigators, Jeremy's story stretched credibility. He had said that um, when Brad was hit by the bullet that he flew back and he hit the wall. Well, very seldom does someone fly back. That's movies, okay, that's theatrics. Normally when somebody gets shot by a bullet, they drop. So, there were things that he was recounting to us that we, we did not feel were totally accurate. Detectives returned to the Bach residence with a search warrant.
they collected the two handguns that Jeremy's stepfather kept in the house, including the 357 Magnum revolver used in the shooting. And though investigators found traces of Brad Hansen's blood in the kitchen, the findings did little to refute Jeremy's claim that the shooting was accidental. As long as investigators were unable to locate the victim's body, proving murder would be difficult. Blood evidence convinced Phoenix police that missing 13-year-old Brad Hansen was dead. Though they had been unable to locate his body, his classmate, Jeremy Bach, claimed that he accidentally shot the boy while they played cops and robbers. In a panic, he said he disposed of Brad's body in the trash. But investigators suspected that Brad Hansen had been murdered out of jealousy. Now they needed to prove it. Police turned to forensic examiners for help. At the Phoenix Police Department crime lab, firearms expert Mahish Patel looked for evidence that could prove whether or not the shooting was an accident. The scenario that was given to me was that Jeremy might have struck the side of the, or the edge of the table and uh, might have accidentally discharged the firearm. The 357 was constructed with a hammer block which is designed to prevent it from discharging if accidentally dropped or bumped. Though incriminating, that didn't prove that Jeremy had intentionally fired the weapon. Patel needed to determine how much force had to be applied to the trigger in order to fire the weapon. What we do is uh, take a set of weights and uh, hang them from uh, from the trigger and keep adding on weight to the end of the trigger till it actually goes off and that will tell us how much force was required uh, for that particular firearm. Patel determined that 10 and a quarter pounds of pressure was required to fire the 357 Magnum revolver. He concluded that an accidental flinch would not have been enough to cause the gun to fire. The analysis indicated that Jeremy Bach intentionally pulled the trigger. 13-year-old Jeremy Bach was placed under arrest and charged with murder. Authorities believe that Jeremy invited his friend Brad Hansen to his house and then confronted him about Brad and Jennifer's blossoming relationship. Driven by a jealous rage, Jeremy grabbed his stepfather's gun and shot Brad. Jeremy Bach, the youngest person to be tried as an adult in the state of Arizona, was found guilty of second degree murder and sentenced to 22 years in prison. Brad Hansen's body has never been found. Sometimes, juveniles believe that homicide is the answer to their problems. When that happens, investigators and forensic scientists must focus on the facts, which can turn dreams of a promising future into the reality of a wasted youth. quiet Washington state community becomes the backdrop for a string of brutal murders. And all of the evidence suggests that a serial killer is responsible. As investigators struggle to identify a suspect, 
more bodies continue to surface. In Michigan, the pregnant wife of a promising young attorney is found dead in the couple's home. Though it appears to be the result of a tragic accident, police are not convinced. It falls to forensic examiners to expose the truth. Solving a murder requires a team of experts whose efforts often go unrecognized. When crime fighters meet crime writers, their story is finally told. And many times, it's a tale stranger than fiction. Bellevue, Washington lies just east of the city of Seattle. It's a thriving community of about 100,000 people who live, work, and play here. But in the summer of 1990, young women began turning up dead throughout the city. On Saturday, June 23rd, Bellevue police received a 911 call a restaurant employee had stumbled upon the lifeless body of a young woman. Investigators responded to the scene. They found the victim lying among trash next to a dumpster behind the restaurant. She was nude except for a necklace. Her arms and legs were positioned as if she were lying in a coffin. A pine cone rested in her hands. It was clear that the victim's body had been posed by the killer. Technicians managed to locate a single black hair near the woman. But they found no clues to her identity or that of her killer. Bellevue detective Marvin Skeen was assigned the case. He knew this wasn't going to be an easy murder to solve. Most crime scenes, you know who your victim is. In this particular crime scene, we had no idea at all who our victim was, her identification. We also lacked clothing, so we couldn't provide a clothing description when we asked the public for their assistance in determining who the victim was. The medical examiner concluded that the woman, likely between the ages of 25 and 35, had died as a result of strangulation. She had also been brutally beaten and sexually assaulted. In addition to collecting biological evidence, dozens of fibers clinging to the victim's body were also recovered. Though it wasn't much to work with, Detectives forwarded what little evidence they had to the Washington State Patrol Crime Lab in nearby Tacoma. After examining the fibers under a microscope, all that scientists could conclude was that they had originated from the carpet or trunk mat of a car. Next, the black hair collected from the crime scene was analyzed in the hopes it would provide some clue to the killer's identity. Forensic scientist Terry McAdam. You can look at it for predominantly pigmentation helps us to decide which possible broad racial groups it may belong to. From the color, texture, and shape, McAdam determined that the hair had come from an African American male. But having been found among trash and debris, its connection with the crime was uncertain. Investigators knew the best way to find this killer would be to first identify the victim. But no missing persons reports filed in the city of Bellevue matched their victim. We went to the news media who 
of course were interested in this in the case asked for their assistance we also went to teletypes and bulletins to surrounding law enforcement agencies asking them to check for missing individuals in their cases soon after investigators got their first break in a neighboring jurisdiction a woman had reported her roommate missing from photos taken at the autopsy she identified the victim as her 27 year old friend Marianne Polreich She said that she had last seen Marianne three nights earlier as she prepared to go out for the evening. Marianne had borrowed her roommate's necklace. It was the same one found around the victim's neck. Marianne usually spent her Fridays at a bar just a few blocks from where her body was found. The roommate indicated to us that Marianne's personality was one that was a free spirit and that Marianne definitely enjoyed dancing and that she would go to the various local clubs to dance. That was her main purpose as far as recreation. We learned that Marianne was a very hard worker. We learned that also from co-workers and from employers. But the roommate indicated to us that Marianne would not go with a stranger, someone unknowing to her. Following up on the roommate's information, police went to the bar where Marianne spent her Friday nights. The restaurant manager knew her well, and she had been there the night before her body was discovered. Though he hadn't noticed who she was with, he believed she had left in a hurry. Marianne had forgotten her sweater and purse. Investigators this collected the items, hopeful they contained some clue to her killer's identity. But the evidence failed to yield any useful information. The investigation into Marianne Polreich's murder was going nowhere. and the caseload for Bellevue detectives was about to increase. On August 9th, 1990, police were dispatched to the home of Carol Beathy. Her ex-husband, Paul, had received a call from his two young children earlier that day. They said that their mom was locked inside her bedroom and wouldn't come out. When Paul came to the house, he discovered his 36-year-old ex-wife, Carol, dead inside her bedroom. It looked as though she had shot herself. When police entered the room, however, it became clear this was no suicide. Though a shotgun lay near the victim, it had not been fired. Instead, the killer had posed the victim's nude body and used the shotgun graphically as a prop. Carol Beathy had been sexually assaulted and beaten to death. But no biological evidence of rape was found. Technicians collected a few black hairs from the sheets. The robbery did not appear to be a motive. Family members later determined that Carol's heirloom ring was missing. For Bellevue homicide detective Dale Foote, the similarities between the Marianne Polreich and Carol Beathy murders had to be more than coincidental. Bellevue is a is pretty quiet suburban town, and, and we, we don't have a whole lot of homicides here, so we have two cases with, with women that are openly displayed and they're posed nude. Um, yeah, we're having some questions. Why are these two cases so similar in nature? Is there any connection between them? Do they know each other? Do their friends know each other? Um, you know, did they work together? Did they, 
you know, uh, attend some of these nightclubs together? We just didn't know. So some of those questions we had to answer and answer real fast. To find out if the cases were in fact connected, police forwarded the hairs recovered from the Carol Beathy crime scene to the lab. When examiners compared those to the one recovered from the Marianne Polreich crime scene, they concluded that the hairs had originated from the same person. Bellevue police were now faced with the possibility that a serial killer was loose in their city. Looking to find a common thread between the two victims, investigators began interviewing Carol Beathy's co-workers at a popular restaurant where she had worked as a waitress. Carol's friends could not imagine why anyone would have wanted to hurt her. Though she and her ex-husband Paul were divorced, they maintained a great relationship. And Carol's two daughters constantly showered her with love and affection. Though Carol Beathy would sometimes go to nightclubs, police were unable to establish any connection between her and Marianne Polreich. The two unsolved murder investigations quickly became front page news. Soon, the mystery caught the attention of veteran crime writer Jack Olson. With 10 true crime novels to his credit, Olson recognized that as a writer, this story was too unusual to be ignored. I think the thing that made this case unusual was the posing of the bodies. That is not seen. It is seen, but it's not seen very often. It, it represents some kind of a deep-seated, uh, deep-seated hatred of women. And Bellevue police feared that such a deep-seated hatred would not simply go away on its own. If they didn't identify a suspect in the killings, and fast, it would only be a matter of time until more victims turned up dead. Police in Bellevue, Washington struggled to solve the sexual assaults and murders that had claimed the lives of two young women. The bodies of 27-year-old Marianne Polreich and 36-year-old Carol Beathy were discovered less than two months apart. Having found both victims savagely beaten, sexually assaulted, and their bodies posed after death, investigators had reason to believe that the murders were the work of one predator. But so far, they had no idea who that was or when he would strike next. On September 3rd, 1990, Police in neighboring King County received a 911 call. The body of 24 year old Randy Levine had been discovered by her landlady. She had been savagely beaten, and her nude body was posed suggestively in her bed. Technicians located a single dark hair near the victim's body. The only item determined to be missing from the room was an antique ring. At autopsy, the medical examiner confirmed that Randy Levine had died as a result of blunt force trauma to the head. Though she had also been sexually assaulted, no biological evidence was found. But the medical examiner did find evidence that the young woman had been tortured. 283 tiny puncture wounds dotted her body. The pattern of some of the injuries suggested that the killer had played a game of tic-tac-toe. Because the Levine homicide happened outside the city limits of Bellevue, its parallels to the unsolved Polreich and Beathy murders might have gone unnoticed. But then, Bellevue Police Detective Ed Mott received a call from a paramedic who happened to be called to all three crime scenes. Yo, yeah, this is Lieutenant Ed Mott with Bellevue. And he couldn't help but notice the similarities. He says, I'm not a cop, I'm not a policeman. He says, but 
the last three murder cases I've been to, he says it's really odd that the three bodies have been posed. Bellevue police also learned that Randy Levine had been to a Bellevue nightclub the night before she was found murdered. There could now be little doubt that a serial killer had claimed the lives of all three women. Officers from throughout the area began pooling their resources, desperate to identify this killer before he struck again. The senselessness of the homicides left veteran crime writer Jack Olson struggling for answers. He wondered why these women in particular had been targeted for murder. He could find no rational explanation. And they were perfectly fine women doing exactly what we, we would expect decent young women of their age, 20, 30, 35, to be doing. They held jobs, they were responsible. Yes, they did uh, go to nightclubs now and then. They're admirable people. As the hunt for the serial killer intensified, an intelligence officer with the Seattle Police Department believed he had uncovered a possible lead. A few days after the Randy Levine homicide in King County, a man named George Waterfield Russell was arrested near her residence for impersonating a police officer. According to the reports, when 32-year-old Russell was pulled over for traffic violations, the officer saw him try to hide something under the vehicle. At first, Russell identified himself as an undercover police officer, but later recanted. Suspicious, the patrol officer searched his car. He located a police scanner, a buck knife, and two IDs. Hidden underneath the vehicle, he found a loaded handgun. A check of the serial numbers revealed that the gun had recently been stolen. Russell was placed under arrest for impersonating an officer and being in the possession of a stolen weapon. A records check showed that Russell had an extensive criminal record, which included sexual assaults and cat burglaries. Mostly, George Russell stole jewelry. A further background check revealed that Russell was known to frequent Bellevue area nightclubs, and he had a reputation. Well, George was a charmer. And basically, he was liked in the nightclubs. He was a popular man in the nightclubs. He had a good line of chatter. He would sidle over next to the DJ, and they'd have a nice conversation. And then he'd sidle over to the bar and have a nice conversation with the, with the bartender. And then various people, various, uh, usually young women who came under his aura, would sit with him, would buy him drinks, uh, would tell him what a great guy he was. Though that wasn't a crime, to investigators, it went a long way in explaining how the three victims could have been manipulated into being alone with the killer. Hey, how you doing? I'm detective. Detectives wanted to speak with George Russell about the murders. He claimed he didn't know anyone named Carol Beathy or Randy Levine. However, he admitted knowing Marianne Polreich. In fact, he had seen her at a bar the night before she was found murdered. But, he said, they weren't there together and didn't speak. Recalling that fibers from a vehicle had been recovered from Polreich's body, police asked for permission to search his car. Russell claimed he had borrowed a friend's truck that night. Eager to cooperate, he gave police the address of his friend who had lent him the vehicle. The man confirmed he had lent Russell his truck several months earlier. He added that when Russell returned the vehicle the following day, there were large stains on the seats. 
and the interior of the car reeked from a horrible smell. It was so bad, he scrubbed the truck clean later that day. For investigators looking for proof that George Russell was a serial killer, that was the worst news they could hear. Investigators in Bellevue, Washington, believe that 32-year-old George Russell was responsible for a string of brutal sexual assaults and murders that had claimed the lives of three young women. Now they needed to prove it. Police located the vehicle Russell had borrowed the night that the first victim, Marianne Polwright, was killed, hopeful it contained evidence of murder. But in the days following the homicide, the truck had been thoroughly cleaned by its owner. But beneath the upholstery, technicians located a suspicious stain. It appeared to be blood. However, it was too degraded for a more comprehensive analysis. Fiber samples from the vehicle's carpet were also collected. At the Washington State Patrol Crime Lab, examiners compared the fibers recovered from the truck to those collected from the body of Marianne Polwright. Though they were consistent with one another, supervising forensic scientist Terry McAdam knows that no analysis is perfect. We can't say that that fiber came from that car because unless we can take the exact fiber and match up its ends, we can't say that. What we can say is the fiber we found in a suspect's car matches that found on the uh, clothing of the victim as regards to having similar microscopic characteristics. We can't say it's a match. Still, the finding was enough to allow investigators to obtain a search warrant for the suspect's apartment. There, they found a gym bag filled with slips of paper with women's names and phone numbers written on them. Somebody. Police contacted several of the women whose names were found in Russell's home. Most knew George Russell well. Though many had no idea how he got their phone numbers, they didn't feel threatened. Russell had told them he was an undercover cop. Homicide detective Dale Foote. And we kept hearing these same stories about George working for the police and, and being an undercover agent and that kind of thing. Um, George is a very articulate, he's a very charismatic young man. And uh, a lot of people bought into his story. And, uh, and it, actually, the fact that they bought, in, bought into his story uh, kind of was a hindrance to us because they'd rather trust George and they would rather trust the police. Get up and get back with you. But one of the women contacted felt differently and she had an interesting story for police. She said that recently, George Russell had given her an antique ring. It was his way of apologizing for standing her up on a date the week before. Though she had suspicions that the ring had been stolen, she reluctantly accepted the gift. Shortly after that, she learned Russell was a suspect in the murders. When she began to hear that George was involved or possibly involved with these homicides, she became frightened. And she gave this ring to, to another friend of hers who had, just happened to be leaving town. He was on his way to uh, Florida. And so he took that ring with him. And having arrived down there a little short of cash, he went down to a, a pawn shop and pawned this ring. Fortunately, that ring was still there when we called. Investigators confirmed that it was the same ring that had been stolen from Randy Levine's room at the time of her murder. Convinced they had the serial killer, investigators next looked to tie the suspect to the murder of Marianne Polreich. Detective Marvin Skeen decided to take advantage of a new forensic technology called DNA testing. At the time in 1991, 
introducing DNA evidence into court was the first time that it had occurred in King County in the state of Washington. So it was new, very new, and uh, it was something that had to be looked at and uh, a lot of time spent on uh, to make sure that we did it properly and to get it accepted by the court. It was time well spent. On January 10, 1991, examiners determined that George Russell's DNA matched the biological samples found on Mary Ann Polreich. He was subsequently charged with her murder. Based on the hair analysis, he was also charged with the murders of Carol Beathy and Randy Levine. Police believe that George Russell used his abundant charm to lure women into his web. And once he had them where he wanted, he pounced on the unsuspecting victims. George Waterfield Russell was convicted of the three murders. He was sentenced to two consecutive life terms, plus 28 years. George is a professional listener, not because he really cares, but because that's the way he takes your defenses down and can do whatever he wants. Now, I spent three hours with George at Walla Walla Penitentiary, and I, I, I mean, this is, this is one of the most horrendous killers that ever lived, but it was, it was a delightful three hours. He's interesting on every subject. Uh, he's friendly, he smiles, and he cracks little jokes. Um, that's all the exterior. What there is beneath that, I don't think even George knows. Shock value was part of George Russell's murderous plan, and he went to great lengths manipulating his crime scenes to achieve it. Oftentimes, the significant facts of a case lie just below the troubled surface. Just north of Detroit, Michigan, lies the city of Hazel Park. Its three square miles are home to 8,000 families, and in 1999, one ugly scandal. On the afternoon of Monday, August 16th, the Hazel Park police dispatcher received a frantic call. What took place? A man reported that his wife had accidentally shot herself. When the responding officer arrived a few minutes later, Michael Fletcher, a prominent local attorney, was waiting outside his home. His wife was inside. He had checked for a pulse, but she wasn't breathing. He led the officer to the bedroom where his 29-year-old wife, Leanne, lay on the floor. Following protocol, the officer kept Michael Fletcher from entering the room. But there was nothing anyone could do. Leanne Fletcher was dead, the result of a single gunshot wound to the head. Any shooting death, even an accidental one, is treated as a crime scene. And this one was no different. Crime scene technicians began processing the room, looking for evidence to help them reconstruct what had happened. They collected the 45 caliber handgun found inches away from the victim's body. Unsure of what to make of the findings, police began searching through the contents of the victim's purse, looking for a suicide note she may have left behind. But what they found was a greeting card from her husband. He was expressing his joy over Leanne's recent pregnancy. Leanne Fletcher's body was removed for autopsy. 
For investigators, all of the findings suggested the expectant mother's death had resulted from a tragic accident. Police in Hazel Park, Michigan, continued to investigate the tragic shooting death that had claimed the life of 29-year-old expectant mother, Leanne Fletcher. The victim's husband, Michael Fletcher, was brought in to make a statement. The 29-year-old attorney couldn't believe that his pregnant wife was dead. Michael told police that after dropping off their three-year-old daughter earlier that morning, he and Leanne went to a local firing range. He wanted her to learn how to properly shoot a handgun in case she ever needed to protect herself and the children. At first, Leanne was hesitant to handle the weapon. But according to Michael, she finally became comfortable and then fired a few rounds. When the couple returned home, Michael wanted to clean up and change clothes before heading off to work. He asked Leanne to load bullets into the clip and then put the weapon in its case that he kept by the side of the bed. The next thing he knew, he heard a shot rushed out to find his wife bleeding to death. He was certain that the safety was on when he handed her the weapon. And he didn't remember that there was a round already in the chamber. As a matter of procedure, investigators collected the shirt Fletcher had been wearing at the time of the accident for testing. Though Michael Fletcher's account was consistent with an accidental shooting, as a matter of routine, investigators needed to interview the couple's friends and family members. When questioned, the victim's mother was upset and angry. She said she never trusted Michael Fletcher, and she was convinced her daughter's death was no accident. Nearly six months earlier, Leanne had complained to her mother she was unhappy in the marriage and wanted a divorce. When she confronted her husband, he was furious to learn she had gone so far as to hire a divorce lawyer. But soon after, Michael began trying to repair the marriage. He had just started to earn a substantial income and the mother believed he was simply trying to avoid having to pay alimony. The information led investigators to take a closer look at Leanne's death. They forwarded the 45 caliber handgun to forensic examiners, believing it possible that the gun had misfired in the hands of an inexperienced Leanne Fletcher. Using weights attached to the trigger, they found that to successfully discharge the weapon, a significant amount of force had to be applied. It was unlikely that the gun would have accidentally gone off on its own. But that still left investigators with the possibility, however unlikely, that the expectant mother had taken her own life. At autopsy, medical examiner Dr. L.J. Dragovich looked for signs of suicide. Though large blood stains were found on the victim's hands, he could find no gunpowder residue or mist-like blood spatter, which are usually present with self-inflicted gunshot wounds. There will be fine mist of blood created by the bullet impacting the skin and causing the wound. I would have been able to see evidence of that uh, fine mist droplet pattern on the hand um, of the victim herself. That was not there. When he examined the wound, 
he noticed that the size and shape of the powder burns, or stippling patterns on Li An's head, were consistent with the weapon having been fired from less than two feet away. The bullet had entered from above and behind the victim's right ear. Based on his findings, Dr. Dragovich concluded that it would be nearly impossible for Lee Ann Fletcher to have held the gun in the position needed to account for the trajectory of the bullet. It's very uncomfortable to try to self-inflict the injury in the way that, um, that you have to be a contortionist to be able to do that. In addition to having an arm long enough, this, this is not uh, physically possible. Though the findings were powerful, they didn't prove Michael Fletcher had killed his wife. Still, rumors began to circulate through the small community. Freelance writer Tom Henderson followed the story and conducted his own investigation. But as an outsider, he knew that uncovering the truth would not be easy. I gathered the information by just basic reporting. You, you get used to when you're a, a reporter being outside your comfort zone, girding yourself up to knock on that door with people that don't really want to see you, saying, hi, I want to do a book about your family's tragedy. Will you cooperate? Slowly, people opened up to Henderson. Those close to the couple did not speak kindly about the young attorney. But they all agreed that Lee Ann was a supportive and dedicated mother and a wonderful human being. Lee Ann Fl Fletcher, by all accounts, uh, was everybody's best friend. And that's, that was one of the touching things, is you would interview friends, uh, sisters. Everybody said, Lee Ann was my best friend. Michael Fletcher was asked to come into the station to answer questions. Stating he had nothing to hide, he agreed, but only under the watchful eye of his attorney. He admitted to police that his marriage had been shaky, but over the past several months, he said that he and Leanne had managed to reconcile their differences. In fact, just two days before her death, Leanne prepared a special dinner for the family. She used the occasion to have the couple's daughter announce to everyone that there was going to be a new baby in the family. Michael was elated. Though he couldn't explain the evidence surrounding Leanne's death, he insisted he was still very much in love with his wife. In the four or five months before the shooting, they were, by all accounts, the happiest that they'd ever been. Uh, she told her family, her sisters, her friends that he was finally being the guy that she'd wanted him to be. Though the medical examiner's findings had led investigators to suspect foul play, they struggled to find evidence to support that theory. Police went to the shooting range where Michael had taken Leanne on the morning of her death. The manager of the range recalled the couple well. He said he never saw the victim fire the gun. And despite her husband's persistence, she refused even to handle it. That contradicted Michael Fletcher's story that Leanne fired the weapon. Investigators theorized Michael had organized the trip to the shooting range in order to get gunpowder residue on his wife's hands before he shot her. If that were the plan, it failed. But for those following the investigation, the case against Michael Fletcher was hardly clear cut there wasn't a shred of hard evidence that proved Fletcher had murdered his wife. And there was no obvious motive. Mick Fletcher 
didn't stand to gain anything financially from her death. There was no insurance policy. The house, in fact, was in her name, and her parents ended up being uh, responsible for its sale. Uh, his family didn't get any of the proceeds. He didn't get any of the proceeds. There was no financial gain. However, the medical examiner's findings were enough to allow investigators to obtain a warrant to search the suspect's house. Hidden in Michael's closet, they uncovered a secret stash of emails, photographs, and love letters. But the items had nothing to do with Michael's wife, Leanne. It appeared Michael Fletcher had a mistress. And more surprisingly, she was a respected district court judge. Police in Hazel Park, Michigan, suspected that the shooting death of 29-year-old expectant mother, Leanne Fletcher, was no accident. While looking for evidence to prove that her husband, prominent local attorney Michael Fletcher, was responsible, investigators learned he had been having an affair with a respected district court judge. Detectives went to interview the 32-year-old judge. When confronted with the evidence, she admitted she and Michael had been involved in a romantic relationship for about a year. She said she last saw Michael the night before Leanne died. He had come by her house. Michael hadn't mentioned that Leanne was pregnant. In fact, he told his mistress that he and Leanne lived like strangers and the only reason he stayed in the marriage was for the sake of his young daughter. His true feelings were for the judge. The judge, who was also married, was tolerant of the situation, at least for the time being. But she had one condition. If she found out that Michael was being intimate with Leanne, the judge would end the relationship immediately. Hazel Park homicide detective Thomas Clayman realized he had just uncovered a possible motive. When Mr. Fletcher found out that his wife was pregnant, uh, caused us to believe that she could not find out, the judge could not find out, because if they were having sexual relations per her, the relationship would be over. Detectives soon learned that it was more than just an affair that was at stake for Michael Fletcher. Emmy ruled it a homicide. In her statements to police, the judge admitted that after she and Fletcher became involved, she had helped his career. She made him the court-appointed attorney in dozens of cases, more than any other local attorney. It translated into thousands of dollars of extra income for the ambitious lawyer. Crime writer Tom Henderson knew this story was as compelling as it was tragic. This case is about a set of dynamics that you, you would only expect to come across in a made-for-TV movie. You've got the really good-looking young attorney. You've got the really good-looking vivacious wife. You've got the powerful, young, pretty judge. The triangle, the classic triangle. And you've got uh, a dead woman on a floor. Uh, it just caught everybody's attention. This shows that he knew she was pregnant. Though police believed they had finally established a motive, they struggled to find solid physical evidence that could prove Michael Fletcher was a cold-blooded killer. Because I want to make sure... But there was one item that had not been tested. The shirt Fletcher wore at the time of the shooting. After reviewing the suspect's statement, Detective Clayman realized the shirt might contain proof of the young attorney's guilt. He stated that he was not in the room when the gunshot went off. Uh, prosecutors wanted that shirt to test uh, for the possibility of blood spatter or mist being on that shirt. Uh, from the naked eye, uh, the shirt observed to be uh, clean or without stain. Uh, the human eye, you could not see any of the stains. It was then taken to uh, Michigan State Police Crime Lab. 
Under a magnifying glass, examiner David Woodford could find no traces of blood. But then, on the cuff of the right sleeve, he noticed tiny mist-like stains. Looking to identify the substance, Woodford placed the shirt under a stereo microscope. Under the high-powered lens, he determined that the minute stains were, in fact, human blood. Their mist-like pattern was consistent with being high-velocity blood spatter, which are produced by the blowback from a firearm. The evidence contradicted Michael Fletcher's claim that he was not in the room when his wife was shot. More importantly, the blood on the cuff put him within two feet of the victim when the bullet struck her head. Police finally had enough evidence to arrest Michael Fletcher. And it came just in time. When police arrived, they found the suspect near a camper parked in front of the house. Michael Fletcher was placed under arrest and charged with the murder of his pregnant wife. The prosecution's contention is that this was a orchestrated, well-planned homicide that took months to carry out. He'd been nice to her for months. He'd been sweet-talking her, getting into her good graces. Bought her a car that morning, not because he loved her, but because he needed an alibi. Took her to the gun range, not because he wanted her to share a hobby with him, but because he needed to get gunpowder on her hands. But this case was not over. On August 19th, the day of Leanne's funeral, Michael Fletcher's lawyer was granted the right to a second autopsy by a renowned medical examiner. But he was at a disadvantage because the victim's body had been cleaned, embalmed, and her skull reconstructed. However, based on his experience and the size and location of the wound, he believed that it was plausible that the gunshot wound had been self-inflicted. Dr. Dragovic did, did the first autopsy, and his conclusion was pretty obvious. This is murder. Uh, this is not accidental or self-inflicted. The defense hired their own uh, medical examiner. His results weren't conclusive at all, which is fine for the defense. They, they just wanted someone to say, this is not clear cut. But ultimately, those findings were not enough to create reasonable doubt in the minds of jurors. The evidence suggested that when Michael Fletcher learned his wife was pregnant, he realized that his relationship with his mistress would be destroyed. And there was too much at stake to simply let that happen. After returning from the firing range, Michael saw his opportunity and took it. Michael Fletcher was convicted of homicide in the second degree and sentenced to life in prison. Murder is the most senseless of human tragedies. And strangely, the most compelling. Writers are compelled to write about it. Readers are compelled to read of it. And though forensics can never explain why someone is driven to kill, it can provide us with the satisfaction of bringing the guilty to justice. Store clerk is killed during a robbery in Tennessee. 
When the suspect claims it was an accident, police turn to forensic examiners to prove cold-blooded murder. Two people are found brutally murdered in an Albany, New York boarding house. To capture the killer, investigators rely on 19th century technology. In Louisiana, a fisherman discovers the body of a murdered woman. A footprint left in blood is investigators' only clue to her killer's identity. When there are no witnesses to a murder, police must find other ways to solve their case. But unseen no longer means unobserved, and killers are finding themselves caught in the camera's eye. In this episode, some of the names have been changed. In the early morning hours of July 2nd, 1995, police in Chattanooga, Tennessee received a 911 call. A man had discovered the bullet-ridden body of a store clerk inside a local gas station convenience store. Investigators and forensic technicians from the Chattanooga Police Department responded to the scene. In the back storage room, detectives located the male victim. The manager later identified him as 34-year-old employee Lenny King. He had been shot in the arm and twice in the chest by a large caliber weapon that had been fired at close range. Investigators found handcuffs locked to the sink next to the victim's body. As technicians began processing the scene for evidence, they found blood stains on the outside of the door leading into the storage room. Examiners determined that the blood had originated from the victim. The team next made their way into the service area of the store. The cash register and safe had been cleaned out. The homicide appeared to be the result of a robbery gone bad. The killer had made off with more than $2,000. But technicians were unable to locate any fingerprints left behind by the robber. Investigators hoped that the store's security cameras could provide some clues. When the manager played the surveillance tape, investigators realized the suspect had been caught on video entering the store. And as the manager watched images of the cash register and safe being cleaned out, he believed he recognized the robber. It looked like a former employee named Jason Rhodes. The manager pulled his files, looking for more information. According to employment records, the 22-year-old had only worked at the store for a few weeks and the victim, Lenny King, had trained him. According to the manager, Lenny King was a well-liked and valued employee who treated everyone with kindness. But King had complained that Jason Rhodes was lazy and inattentive, and Jason didn't take the job very seriously. After his training period was over, Jason only showed up for work once and then quit. At the police station, detectives reviewed the surveillance video again. The tape, which consisted of a series of still photographs shot every two seconds, simultaneously displayed images from the store's two security cameras. As they watched the images frame by frame, they noticed that the suspect was brandishing what appeared to be a 357 revolver as he walked into the store but a time and date stamp on the video obscured the image of the victim being approached by the gunman and forced into the storage room. And that room, where the victim was killed, was out of the camera's range. 
investigators were able to print a clear image of the gunman. To confirm the killer's identity, police showed a photograph of the suspect to Jason Rhodes' father, Heartbroken by what he saw, Mr. Rhodes positively identified the man in the photo as his son. When asked if he knew his son's present whereabouts, the father said that Jason and his girlfriend, Sonia Altman, had left town the same day Lenny King was found murdered. Jason hadn't told his father why he was leaving, but he did say that he probably would not be coming home. Mr. Rhodes gave investigators a description of his son's truck. Police had positively identified Lenny King's killer. And based on the senselessness of the murder, Sergeant Rodney Bowman knew they needed to apprehend Jason Rhodes quickly. Well, we're looking for a young man that definitely didn't have any value to life. We really at that time had no idea if he might be drug-induced or, or what his behavior was. All we knew is that this was a deliberate act. It appeared to be a deliberate act, and uh, we needed to get this man off the street. Detectives theorized that the suspect and his girlfriend would eventually contact their loved ones. They began tracing all the calls made to members of their families. Within hours, the tactic paid off. Jason's girlfriend, Sonia Altman, had contacted her grandmother, and the call was traced to a hotel in Nashville, Tennessee. Descriptions of the suspect, his girlfriend, and the vehicle they were traveling in were forwarded to the Nashville police. On the evening of July 3rd, Nashville authorities spotted Jason Rhodes' truck as it pulled into a gas station. As the suspect exited his vehicle to fill up, detectives moved in. Jason Rhodes was placed under arrest on suspicion of aggravated robbery and murder. His girlfriend, Sonia Altman, was also placed under arrest. Investigators began searching the suspect's vehicle. On the front seat, police found a money bag that contained several hundred dollars in cash. Detectives also found a box of ammunition for a 357 handgun, the same type as the one used to murder Lenny King. The following day, Chattanooga police traveled to Nashville to question Jason Rhodes about the homicide. At first, he denied any knowledge of the crime. But when confronted with the evidence against him, he decided to cooperate. Jason admitted to killing Lenny King. But he said it was a horrible accident. He never intended to harm his former co-worker. According to Jason, he entered the store with the intent to commit robbery. He claimed that he brought the victim into the storage room in order to handcuff him to the sink so he would be unable to trip any alarm devices. But as he attempted to get the cuffs around Lenny King's wrist, the store clerk fought back, grabbing for the gun. Several shots went off, and Jason realized that Lenny had been hit. Panicked, he grabbed the money and fled the scene. Though Jason Rhodes had confessed to killing Lenny King inside the storage room, investigators didn't believe the story. blood found on the outside of the doorframe suggested that the victim had been shot well before the two entered the room and struggled. But unless investigators could prove that Jason Rhodes was lying, he would likely stand trial for a lesser manslaughter charge. Detectives were convinced Jason Rhodes was a cold-blooded killer. Now they needed to find proof to ensure that the young man would never be free to kill again. 
Police in Chattanooga, Tennessee had arrested the man responsible for the murder of 34-year-old store clerk Lenny King, shot to death during the commission of a robbery. After being caught on the store's surveillance video, Jason Rhodes admitted to the killing. But he claimed his gun had accidentally gone off as he and the victim struggled in the storage room. Detectives scrutinized the video frame by frame, looking for proof that Jason Rhodes was lying and that the murder had been premeditated. Then, in one of the frames, they noticed that the victim's knees appeared to buckle and he grabbed for his arm soon after Jason Rhodes entered the store. Homicide Detective Sergeant Tim Carroll theorized the suspect began shooting as soon as he walked in. Once we got the video slowed down where we could see it, uh, Sergeant Rodney Bowman and I both agreed that Jason Rose came in the store and shot from the, from the get-go. It wasn't just going in the back of the storeroom and, and wrestling around and gun going off. Investigators knew that if they could prove Jason Rhodes fired as soon as he entered the store, they could charge him with premeditated first-degree murder. But that would not be easy. Where Jason Rhodes is positioned in the video, it's underneath all this date and time stamping. We can't see any muzzle flash. We can't see the, the weapon actually jerk. So our theory is we got to get this uh, video enhanced where we can either eliminate the, the wording or can we see a muzzle flash. Investigators turned to scientists at the U.S. Department of Energy's Oak Ridge National Laboratory. There, Ken Tobin heads the Image Science and Machine Vision Group. His expertise lies in analyzing video images in order to extract data that is not readily visible. He agreed to work the case. The tape that we received from the Chattanooga Police Department was typical low quality. It had a, a split screen characteristic, which meant there were two video cameras that were in the actual store where the robbery took place. They were both displayed simultaneously on the camera. But the camera that actually caught the shooting of the, of the store proprietor um, had him very far away. It was uh, obscured by the time and date stamp, which was posted in the upper left-hand quadrant of the uh, image, and uh, it didn't look very, very possible to see anything new. To confirm investigators' suspicions that Lenny King was fired upon before entering the back room, Tobin needed a clear image. First, he would have to remove the date and time stamp from the video. To do that, he applied computer software to the images as part of a process referred to as subtraction analysis. The analysis works by comparing each frame of video to the next and then eliminating images that remain constant and unchanged throughout. So the subtraction process in this case, the, the goal is to remove everything that's constant in the scene, the, the, the shelves, the coffee pot, the time and date stamp, which was superimposed over part of the image, and leave nothing but, for example, in this case, the, the muzzle flash itself and the, the recoil of the body, the person holding the gun as it was fired. Through subtraction analysis, Tobin was able to capture a blip in the video that was previously obscured by the time and date stamp. And it appeared to be the muzzle flash from Jason Rhodes' gun. Tobin's analysis had brought investigators one step closer to proving that Jason Rhodes had entered the convenience store with the intent to kill Lenny King. But to win a first-degree murder conviction, they needed to be certain that the blip uncovered by Tobin's analysis was in fact a muzzle flash and not a glitch in the video itself. To find out, detectives returned to the convenience store to conduct their own experiment. Using the same 357 Magnum revolver used in the murder, they fired the weapon into old phone books, making certain to be in view of the store's surveillance cameras. 
we fired it into like a couple of old city directories in that same corner area, but not in the same area where this time stamping was. So we fired several rounds and uh, of course recorded on the store surveillance film and then our crime scene people also videotaped it as well. Likelihood. This is consistent with the video of the reconstruction was sent to Ken Tobin for a comparison with the one taken during the actual crime. Then we have the firing here. When he compared the muzzle flash from Sergeant Carroll's gun to the blip on the video taken at the time of the murder, he concluded they were consistent in shape and intensity. Investigators now had the evidence they needed to prove that Jason Rhodes' story was a lie and one isolated frame of video had been the difference in proving first-degree murder. I would compare what Oak Ridge National Lab did on this one little section of video to one drop or, or hair of DNA. It was that crucial. Uh, without what they did, we didn't have what I would consider the video DNA for this case. To avoid the death penalty, Jason Rhodes, on the advice of his attorney, pled guilty to first-degree murder and aggravated murder. Police believe Jason Rhodes entered the store knowing he would kill the clerk who could identify him. After shooting him in the arm as he walked in, Rhodes forced Lenny King into the storage room. After a struggle for the gun, Jason shot the victim twice more in the chest at close range. He exited the back room and proceeded to rob the store of $2,000 in cash. Jason Rhodes was sentenced to life in prison. His girlfriend, Sonia Altman, was convicted of being an accessory after the fact and sentenced to two years in prison. Jason Rhodes' crime was exposed through state-of-the-art technology. But to solve a double murder in Albany, New York, investigators must rely on a 19th century invention. On the morning of July 3, 1994, Gary Lang went to check on his mother-in-law at a boarding house that she owned and operated. When he arrived, he noticed her stereo on the steps. The mail hadn't been collected, and the back door was wide open. Inside, the house was in shambles. Then, lying on the kitchen floor, he discovered the brutally beaten bodies of his 86-year-old mother-in-law, Josephine Zurich, and a tenant, Walter Peskowski. Investigators from the Albany Police Department rushed to the home. Police technicians carefully documented the entire house. Blood and debris were everywhere. Detective Anthony Bruno was shocked by what he saw. The house looked literally as if someone had picked it up and shaken it and set it back down. I don't think, uh, aside from the kitchen table, there was a piece of furniture that wasn't turned over. Uh, there wasn't a drawer that hadn't been pulled out and emptied, thrown on the floor. The kitchen itself was covered in blood. Uh, I, there was nowhere to walk on the kitchen floor without stepping in blood. The blood stain patterns found throughout the kitchen were consistent with having been caused by blunt force trauma injuries. And it was likely that a cane with a bloody handle found on the floor was the weapon used to bludgeon the elderly victims. As investigators struggled to find evidence that could point them toward the killer, they uncovered another possible weapon. On top of the kitchen table, they found a cooking pot, dented and stained with blood. For investigators, all of the evidence suggested that the two victims had unwittingly stumbled upon a robbery in progress. And it appeared that the killer, or killers, had left in a hurry. Autopsies confirmed that both victims had died as a result of massive blunt force trauma to the head. 
55-year-old Walter Peskowski had also been strangled. Each of the victims had been struck dozens of times. And the injuries were consistent with having been caused by both the cane and the pot found in the kitchen. The medical examiner determined that the murders had likely occurred between 10 and 11 p.m. the previous evening. Hopeful that the evidence recovered from the crime scene might yield some clue to the killer's identity, detectives brought it to the Albany Police Crime Lab. While processing the bloody pot believed to have been used as a weapon, Detective Dean Halperin noticed what appeared to be a fingerprint on the inside wall. And if it was in fact a print, recovering it would not be easy. The material the pot was made out of um, isn't something that we've had good results with because it has pock marks, um, depressions, plus it, it's very bent out of shape from being struck against the victims. But after it was actually processed with the powder, we could see that we had something in there. We had a print. But the excitement was short-lived. Though investigators had found evidence that could place a suspect at the scene, they couldn't get the camera in the position necessary to obtain a detailed image. Without that, they would be unable to compare it to a suspect print, if and when one emerged. The pot is small, difficult to stick a camera in and get a good picture. Uh, numerous attempts were made at doing that. And we, we had pictures of the print, but they were not of the quality needed to make an identification. Examiners concluded that any attempt to lift the print with adhesive would likely destroy it. And dismantling the murder weapon was not an option. As evidence, the print appeared to be useless. Investigators would have to find another way to identify the killer. Police turned to Josephine Zurich's son-in-law, Gary Lang, for help. After listening to him describe his mother-in-law, police couldn't imagine why anyone would have wanted to harm her. Josephine Zurich was an 86-year-old Polish immigrant who had lived in that uh, home, raised her family there um, since she immigrated to the United States. And they were, she was a law-abiding citizen. Um, the, everyone in the neighborhood knew her. She was known for baking pies for people in the neighborhood. The son-in-law added that Walter Paskowski, a tenant in the house, had also become close to Josephine and the family. Gary said that he and his wife stopped by the boarding house regularly, bringing groceries and offering to help out as often as they could. He recalled that Josephine had recently had problems with one of the younger tenants who rented the basement apartment. In fact, she had started legal eviction proceedings against him when he suddenly moved out of the building. The son-in-law provided investigators with the former tenant's name. A records check revealed that the man currently worked as a cook at a hotel restaurant in the Albany Capital District. Believing they had identified a suspect in the killings, investigators quickly contacted the former tenant and arranged to speak with him. At first, he appeared apprehensive and seemed reluctant to answer any questions. But when police informed him about the murders, he decided to cooperate. He admitted that he moved out after having run-ins with Josephine and Walter. But he insisted he would never harm either of them. On the night of the murders, he claimed he had been working late at the restaurant. Homicide detective Bernard Santandrea began digging deeper into the former tenant's background. But nothing he learned indicated that the young man could be involved in such a brutal double homicide. This was a horrific uh, act of violence. Uh, we just didn't feel this man had this in his nature to do it. Uh, now, that being said, we also verified his whereabouts and uh, his place of employment and 
was verified that during the time we felt the homicides occurred, this individual was working. The investigation was back at square one. With no suspects in the savage double murders, the case threatened to go cold. And that meant a violent killer was still loose on the streets of Albany. Police in Albany, New York, struggled to solve a brutal double homicide at a boarding house that had claimed the lives of the owner, 86-year-old Josephine Zurich, and 55-year-old tenant, Walter Paskowski. Though forensic examiners had located a suspect's fingerprint on a cooking pot used to bludgeon the victims, attempts to recover it had been unsuccessful. Homicide detective Anthony Bruno struggled to identify the killer. We really had a whodunit. Um, these folks had no connections to any uh, wrongdoings or they were not a uh, criminal element. Um, it was difficult to figure out who would have a motive to savagely beat these two people to death, um, aside from the, the burglary, which we believed happened. Police turned to the public for help. Two days after the murders, a woman contacted detectives. After reading the details of the crime in the local paper, she believed that her ex-boyfriend might be involved in the homicides. Around midnight on the evening of the murders, the woman's ex-boyfriend, Johnny Blanchard, had stopped by her apartment unannounced. He seemed agitated and was sweating and out of breath. The girlfriend noticed blood on his clothes. Johnny explained he had been injured in a fight. But as he changed out of the bloody clothes, there were no injuries visible on his body. He refused to answer any more of her questions and left. She hadn't heard from him since. Johnny Blanchard was well known to homicide detective Sergeant Bernard Santandrea. He had an extensive criminal record, which included drug charges and violent assaults. Johnny Blanchard was familiar to me and other investigators in the office. We've known him over the years, uh, knew that he had a propensity for violence, uh, that he would be the type of personality that uh, could ca commit such a crime. Blanchard's records revealed that he had grown up in a house close to where the murders occurred. And he was rumored to be currently squatting in an abandoned home located next door to the victim's residence. Police believed they had finally identified a suspect in the murders. Now they needed to find Johnny Blanchard. His photograph was distributed to all area patrol officers. The following evening, Albany police spotted Johnny Blanchard hanging out near a downtown alley. He was placed under arrest and brought in to speak with homicide detectives. Under questioning, Blanchard was arrogant and uncooperative. He denied knowing the victims and insisted he had no information about the murders. After requesting that a lawyer be present, he asked to make a phone call. After a few hours of questioning, uh, Johnny finally asked if he could call his former girlfriend on the telephone, and he wanted to speak to her before he spoke any further to us. Blanchard wanted to find out what his ex-girlfriend had told police. But while he was on the phone, he was overheard admitting that he had stolen a television and some jewelry from the boarding house. When police confronted the suspect with the information, his attorney showed up. And he refused to allow his client to answer any more questions. Though police had overheard a partial confession, they knew it would never be allowed in as evidence in a murder trial. Still, it gave them an opportunity. 
The owner of the vacant house where Blanchard had been squatting allowed investigators to search the property. There, they recovered a television set and some jewelry that was later identified as belonging to victim Josephine Zurich. Though convinced of Johnny Blanchard's guilt, investigators knew their case was still only circumstantial. To prove murder, they needed hard evidence that could place the suspect at the scene of the crime. Though a fingerprint had been located on one of the murder weapons, police had been unable to get a clear image of the print. Investigators turned to forensic experts at the Connecticut State Police Crime Lab. There, specialist Paul Penders agreed to work the case. After examining the print inside the pot, he realized there would be only one way to get Albany police the evidence they needed to make their case. We knew that there were some difficulties with, the, uh, with lifting the print, it being a blood print and so forth, and it would have to be pretty much done off the photography. The comparison would have to be made with a photograph. But that was easier said than done. Penders would have to find a way to precisely place a camera inside the pot in order to generate a clear image of the evidence. This impression is inside the pot, in the side of the pot, and we need to get a photograph of it straight down from 90 degrees to produce an actual size photograph. You couldn't get a conventional camera in that. Then, Penders had an idea. Though modern cameras could not be manipulated into the position needed, older cameras could. He decided to use a 19th century bellows camera, which was constructed using what is called a slide rail system. The slide rail allows the lens to be moved or slid into place, detached from the body of the camera. The system allows for greater access to images that are in hard to reach locations. Penders was able to slide his lens directly over the latent fingerprint. The film is another key component of the process. Each frame of film is four inches by five inches, much larger than the standard 35 millimeter width. The major advantage of the four x five camera is you photograph the object already its exact size. So it's already life size. There's no question about enlarging or reducing it and the amount of information on that large piece of film to far surpasses what a 35 millimeter frame can give you. The procedure was successful. Using his bellows camera with the slide rail system, Paul Penders was able to get a high contrast photograph of the fingerprint inside the pot. Now, examiners looked to the evidence to prove that Johnny Blanchard had carried out the murders. When the print photographed from inside the pot was compared with known fingerprints taken from Blanchard, examiners concluded they were identical. Is that our man there? Johnny Blanchard was subsequently charged with two counts of murder. Based on the evidence, investigators believe that Johnny Blanchard broke into the boarding house intent on robbing the place. But when 86-year-old Josephine Zurich and 55-year-old Walter Peskowski interrupted the burglary, Blanchard reacted by savagely beating him to death. Johnny Blanchard was found guilty of two counts of murder, depraved indifference, and burglary. He was sentenced to 60 years to life. Suspects with no obvious connections to their victims are difficult to identify. But oftentimes, murders are carried out by those closest to the victim. Just across the Mississippi state line, the Pearl River in southeastern Louisiana is known to sport fishermen as a haven for largemouth bass. On May 21st, 1996, a man headed toward the river in search of a perfect fishing spot. As he made his way through a small clearing, he discovered a decomposed human body. 
the fishermen quickly summoned police. Within minutes, officers and forensic technicians from the St. Tammany Parish Sheriff's Department arrived at the location. Before they began processing the scene, however, crime scene photographers thoroughly documented the entire area. And it was a mess. Investigators found dozens of personal papers and letters scattered around a wide area. An empty backpack lay nearby. The female victim had been beaten and stabbed once in the neck. Officers combed the area looking for clues to the victim's identity. But other than the letters, they found nothing. The unidentified woman was transported to the coroner's office for autopsy. Though the body had decayed beyond recognition, the medical examiner determined that the victim was a Caucasian woman, approximately five feet, seven inches tall, and likely between the ages of 35 and 45. She had been dead less than a week. Cause of death was a single stab wound to the neck, resulting in a laceration of the right carotid artery. Detectives at the St. Tammany Parish Sheriff's Department began the process of trying to identify the murder victim. Captain David Hall didn't have much information to work with. First thing we did was basically get a measurement of the body and try to come up with an idea of what this individual looked like in a, in a living state. Um, we checked missing person files for the uh, Mississippi and Louisiana area. Came up with nothing that fit the script of this young lady. Investigators began sifting through the papers for clues. All of the correspondences were addressed to a woman named Liz. And they were all signed Michael Packer. His return address was located less than 100 miles away in Biloxi, Mississippi. Biloxi police were contacted and dispatched to the address where the letters had originated. Michael Packer was not there. According to his roommate, Packer had left several days earlier to work a job somewhere in Alabama. When questioned further, he stated that he knew a woman named Liz. Her full name was Elizabeth Herdman, and until recently, she and Michael Packer had been romantically involved. The roommate said that Liz and Michael fought constantly, mostly about money. In fact, a few weeks before, one of their arguments threatened to turn violent, prompting the roommate to call police. But rather than suffer in a violent relationship, Liz packed her belongings into a backpack and left. The roommate believed Liz was currently homeless, but he had seen her less than a week ago looking for work at a local employment agency. Hoping to confirm the victim's identity, Louisiana police ran a records check on Elizabeth Herdman. Investigators learned that the 39-year-old woman had been arrested on minor charges several years earlier in Florida, and her fingerprints were on file. When those were compared to the prints lifted from the victim, police found a perfect match. Police had identified the woman found murdered along the shores of the Pearl River. And her ex-boyfriend, who left town around the time of her murder, was the prime suspect. Now, investigators needed to find him. Police in St. Tammany Parish, Louisiana, had identified a woman found murdered near a riverbank as 39-year-old Elizabeth Herdman. To find her killer, investigators began retracing her movements in the days leading up to the murder. Louisiana police traveled to the employment agency in nearby Biloxi, Mississippi, where the homeless woman was last seen alive. The manager there confirmed that Liz Herdman had been in looking for work on May 18th, three days before her body was discovered. 
and Liz had not come in alone that day. According to the records, she had signed in with two men, Arthur Cyber and Alfred Huntsman, and a woman named Felice Fisher. The manager had seen the group together before and knew them to be friends. The manager also confirmed that Michael Packer, Liz Herdman's ex-boyfriend and the prime suspect in her murder, had signed in earlier that same day. But by the time Liz and her friends arrived, he had already left for a job in Mobile, Alabama. Investigators were able to confirm that Packer was several hundred miles away when the murder occurred. Since Liz Herdman had been homeless at the time of her death, identifying a suspect would not be easy. She's living on the street. Anyone could be the suspect. She comes across people capable of committing homicide on a daily basis. Captain Hall began tracking down Liz's three friends, hopeful they could provide information. But a background check revealed that two of those friends, Alfred Huntsman and Arthur Cyber, had extensive criminal records, which included robbery and assault charges. Detectives traveled to a nearby motel where Arthur Cyber had recently been staying. Though he was no longer there, a motel employee remembered Cyber well. He had been staying in a room with two women and another man. One of the women matched Liz Herdman's description. The employee remembered that after the group checked out, she cleaned their room. It looked like there had been a violent struggle. The window had been broken. And there were stains on the bedspread that appeared to be blood. The motel employee hadn't seen anyone from that group around since, and they hadn't left a forwarding address. The information led investigators to now believe that Liz Herdman's friends were involved in her murder. An APB was immediately issued for the three individuals and the car they were believed to be driving. We wanted to uh, alert the nation that we were looking for Arthur Cyber and Alfred Huntsman and Felice Fisher for questioning reference to this homicide. A few days later, police several hundred miles away in Hutchins, Texas, spotted the three suspects. They were taken into custody and transported to Louisiana for questioning. Police searched their vehicle and collected its contents, including six pairs of shoes, some papers, and a few articles of clothing. Under questioning, Alfred Huntsman admitted that he had information about the murder. Huntsman said that while the four friends were staying at the motel, Liz Herdman and Arthur Cyber had gotten into an argument. Liz had recently gotten a job, and Cyber wanted some of her money to buy drugs and alcohol. When she refused, Cyber smashed out the window and became physically abusive. Eventually, things calmed down, and a short while later, Cyber suggested that they all go into town But according to Huntsman, Cyber drove the group to an isolated spot at the Pearl River. He said he wanted to go for a walk with Liz to privately apologize for his behavior at the motel. Several minutes later, Arthur Cyber emerged from the woods alone and covered with blood. He had murdered Liz and the motive was robbery. Cyber threatened to kill him and Felice Fisher if they went to authorities. Huntsman insisted he and Felice never left the vehicle. When confronted with the statement, Arthur Cyber denied the accusation. Though he had been present at the river when the murder occurred, 
he said that it was Alfred Huntsman and Felice Fisher who carried out the homicide. Right off the bat, one started giving up the other, pointing the finger. And that at least lets us know that we've got the three parties responsible. And from there, you just start to meticulously break down the lies that they're giving you and ultimately end up with the truth. For answers, investigators forwarded all of the evidence to forensic examiners at the Louisiana State Police Crime Lab. It was now up to them to find a way to prove which of the suspects had viciously killed Elizabeth Herdman. Police in St. Tammany Parish, Louisiana, had three suspects in custody for the murder of 39-year-old Elizabeth Herdman. But with the suspects pointing the finger at each other, investigators needed to find a way to expose the killer's identity. They turned to examiners at the Louisiana State Police Crime Lab. There, forensic scientist George Shiro began scrutinizing the evidence collected from the crime scene. He focused his attention on a yellow piece of paper stained with the victim's blood. As he examined it more closely, he noticed a shoe print. On its own, he realized that the print would not be enough to establish the killer's identity. Though all three suspects admitted being at the Pearl River, each denied being near the victim when the murder occurred. To determine who was lying, Shiro first needed to know where the evidence was found in relation to the victim's body. For that, he turned to the crime scene photographs. In the photos, he observed several yellow pieces of paper. But after digitizing and enlarging the photographs, he saw that only one was stained with blood. And it was located just inches away from the victim's head. Now, Shiro looked to determine which of the suspects had left the print. He began by comparing the shoes recovered from the suspect's vehicle to the shoe print found within inches of Liz Herdman's body. He quickly eliminated five of the six pairs. But the tread on the remaining pair appeared to be similar to the print from the crime scene. So I examined that shoe more carefully, and what we look for when we're examining shoe prints is we look for random markings on the soles of the shoe that give these, uh, give these shoes their individuality. Shiro generated an impression of the shoe print found in the suspect's car onto a sheet of clear acetate paper. When that was overlaid on top of the bloody print recovered from the crime scene, he found one consistency after another. That is an aha moment. That's when uh, we say, okay, we have, we have a match here. We have enough marks to individualize this shoe print to this shoe. Police determined that the shoe that had left the print belonged to Alfred Huntsman. And Shiro's findings proved that he was within inches of the victim as her blood was shed, something he had previously denied. Confronted with the evidence, Huntsman confessed to taking part in the crime. But he insisted he hadn't worked alone. He said that he, Arthur Cyber and Felice Fisher had driven Elizabeth Herdman to the clearing off of the remote road near the river with the intent to rob her. But the robbery spiraled out of control, and when Liz fought back, Arthur Cyber stabbed her in the neck. Huntsman admitted that he beat the victim while Cyber killed her. Polygraph tests later confirmed that all three suspects had participated in Elizabeth Herdman's murder. Arthur Cyber was convicted of first-degree murder and sentenced to life in prison. Alfred Huntsman received the same sentence. Felice Fisher pled guilty to accessory after the fact for first-degree murder and for second-degree kidnapping. 
she was sentenced to 25 years in prison. Most killers look to strike when their targets are isolated or far away from potential witnesses. When investigators struggle to identify a suspect, they turn to forensic examiners who can expose a killer's guilt caught in the camera's eye.